I don't know about you, but it seems to me as if our past year and a half or so have been filled with grumblings. Mine has. We've had political grumblings and medical grumblings and economic grumblings and grumblings about all the things we've had to change from our normal pattern of life, from our schooling to our socializing to our worship together. So like those ancient Israelites who grumbled about their rations as they trekked through the desert, we've been irritated by a lot of these changes. Our squabbles, sometimes our loss of community, Sometimes we've kvetched about just about everyone in leadership, the way the Israelites complained about Moses half the time, talking about how much better it was in Egypt when there was meat and melons and garlic, even though they were slaves. All those disappointments they've had in that 40-year trek between their escape from Egypt and their settling in the Promised Land. Sometimes we've been like those religious leaders in the Gospel story today, resenting that Jesus dares to say he is the bread that has come down from heaven when they know full well that he was raised in Nazareth by Mary and Joseph. It's been hard for us, I think, to deal with our powerlessness, our forced separation, our forced togetherness sometimes. Of course, the same could be said about many other episodes in our lives. We don't have to be living through a pandemic or through some variety of national storm to realize just how spiritually tired and hungry and how driven we have gotten at times. We have been like Elijah running away from Jezebel's threats of murder. And so pretty regularly we wear ourselves out, running to find even skimpy shade as he did, just a broom brush in the desert, a little peace, just a little safety for a moment. And so we hunger for companionship that's deep and that lasts and that doesn't drive us away. We hunger to be fed in a way that lasts, lasts beyond our loneliness, lasts beyond the threat of our mortality. In fact, even when things are going well, we seem to repeatedly search for a table where we can share good conversation and share our plenty, share our most beloved memories and our fondest hopes. You may have noticed that in John's gospel, in the first few days after Jesus' baptism, disciples begin to be attracted to Jesus. And so they say, Rabbi, where are you staying? And what he says is, Come and see. Follow me. Come and see. On day three of his ministry, not very far into it, he gives the first sign of what he's going to offer us by turning almost 180 gallons of water into wine for a grand wedding. That's the kind of feast, the kind of life Jesus invites to share with him. It's boldly generous and joyfully shared. And that Wedding at Cana is the prequel of that amazing feeding of the multitude that we heard about just a couple weeks ago, where this man who came down, who is where heaven and earth meet, is a man of bounty and compassion. This is a leader who invites and welcomes instead of ordering us around. This is a rabbi who invites us to feast with him on life, completely, always and to share in the feast that he is. A few of you may know my son, Ben Hall. When he was preschool age, I was a young mother and I cooked most of our food from scratch. I wanted him to be healthy, I wanted us to be healthy, and I was at home, so we ate only homemade whole wheat bread, homemade yogurt, steamed fresh vegetables, homemade fruit desserts. And one day about this time of year, I told him that we were getting ready to go drive down to Georgia where my family was, and in a few days we would visit with his grandmother and granddaddy. And he said, oh boy, grandmother cooks good food. <laughs> he was right. She was a very good cook. She didn't particularly like living in the kitchen, but she really did like to cook dishes that she knew were going to please her children and her grandchildren, every one of them. Then one day, several years later, when Ben was about nine, 
I announced to him again that we were going to be heading down to Georgia the next week to visit grandmother and granddaddy. And he disappeared from where I was working and went into some other part of the house and I could hear him rattling around in there. And a few minutes he came back to the kitchen and said, look mom, I made this for grandmother. You can't really read it from where you are, but it's an, a broken piece of wood nailed together that, on which he wrote with the marker, Grandma's Kitchen. <laughs> he meant it, that he liked her food. And so we gave it to her, and she hung that on the wall right next to their table. And it stayed there until they died, and our house was sold. Dessert, uh, excuse me. Now I'm the grandmother, and this sign hangs in my kitchen. And there's connection that's more than just the sign. Every year at this time, just before parents and children die back into school, all of us would gather at my parents' house to celebrate Ben's birthday, my mother's and my sister's shared birthday, my father's birthday. And at that August feast, the dessert was often fresh blackberry cobbler. It was very good. And that's what Ben still requests to this day for his birthday meal. But I'm pretty sure it wasn't just the food that Ben loved. It was also being nourished by the gatherings of our large family as we sat around a big table and celebrated those clumps of spring and fall birthdays as well as Thanksgiving and Christmas. And of course, each cook brought his or her own specialty. Over time, we came to count on Rebecca's sweet potato casserole, Robbie's chocolate pound cake, my ambrosia or congealed cranberry salad, and mom's perfect dressing, corn, green beads, and fried okra, and Aunt Ruth's handmade rolls. Those were little bitty rolls that were wonderful. They were still warm from the oven when they came to the table. They were light, soft, barely sweet, and very yeasty. And Aunt Ruth was kind enough to make enough, enough to last us several days so we could stuff them with leftover turkey or ham and have a little sandwich every now and then. Some people call this style of bread angel biscuits, and it's a very suitable name, I think, because I think they're probably much more tasty than that bread brought by the angel of the Lord to Elijah. At least that's my guess. Now that my siblings and I share the celebratory family meals in our own homes with our children and grandchildren, those dear cooks are still present in memory and in food. I'll be baking mom's blackberry cobbler for Ben's birthday soon. At the holidays, my stepdaughter Amy will make Rebecca's sweet potatoes. I'll still prepare Aunt Ruth's cranberry salad. And next year I may, if I can get my act together, make Aunt Ruth's rolls. It's wonderful when we gather to have all those beloved ones brought there to the table with us into our current feast, brought as food that we remember and have fond memories of. All those long beloved ones still loving my siblings and our children and grandchildren through the food they once provided. They're still feeding us with their best dishes, homemade love and grace. Their past in those celebrations becomes our present and shapes our family's future, as does our Eucharist when we gather for it. That's the kind of food I think many of us have hungered for in the past couple of years as pandemic and politics and economic and everything else have kept us apart. We've hungered for that deep connection with each other, a generous feast on God's grace incarnate in us around a table. So our central act of worship every Sunday gathers us at that table. We claim Jesus' invitation to us Sunday after Sunday and year after year because he has invited to come and see, come and taste, come into his welcome and feed on his grace and companionship with God because that's what he brings to the table. And just as my siblings and I grew up, to be grandparents and parents who now bring the dishes of our elders to family celebrations. So here at God's table, we grow up 
into passing around everything we have brought and everything Christ has brought to us, the grace and care he continually sets before all who come to him. This is what we are to attend to, because what we attend to will become our worship. And at this holy feast, what we attend to is Christ's presence, that living bread that, and that wine poured out for us. It's a meal of eternal life. Of course, eternal life, you know, is not a thing. It's not a possession, something we, a ticket we can stick in our pocket for the last day. It's a relationship. Eternal life is a relationship, a way of living now in God's banquet, the one that heals us and restores us and energizes and calms and grows us. The menu is always the same. This is the bread of heaven that gives life to the world and makes us deeply connected to each other. It gives us real life. Come and see. Follow me, Jesus invites us. Join me in the life of God. Feast with me on the bounty of grace. And neither flood nor fire nor politics nor pandemic need send us off running into the desert when life gets hard. When we are running from whatever Jezebel we think is out to get us and exhausting ourselves in fear. Instead, Jesus calls us to return again and again to the feast he prepares, where all of us always belong, just like we do at our family's birthday feast. This banquet tastes like the unending generosity of God and the best of us. It's good food, as Ben would say, and there's no need to grumble. At this wide family table, as St. Augustine reminds us, just be what you see and receive who you are.